Please be advised, this episode does have content that some may find distressing. As always, listener discretion is advised and it is not suitable for anyone under the age of 13. Hello and welcome to episode 34 of It's Murder Up North. Before I start, I just want to send my love and thoughts to the family and friends of Kieran Bimson. He was the father of three-year-old Francesca Bimson, who died in an arson attack at her home in Merseyside. Kieran dedicated his life to honouring her memory by campaigning for better support for those who lose loved ones through violent crime. Kieran died on the 31st of July 2020 after a suspected heart attack. May he rest in peace and be reunited with his baby once more. I also just want to apologise for the delay in releasing last week's episode. Unfortunately, me and technology don't always get along. This week's podcast of the week is That is so fucked up Hosted by Ashley and Cam I've just started listening to the show and became hooked after the first episode I highly recommend checking them out Here is a sneak peek That is so fucked up It's fucked up So fucked up It is just so damn fucked up that's fucked up. This is That's So Fucked Up, a podcast about cults, murder, and other fucked up stuff. Like, really, really fucked up stuff. He cut off her nipples, tore out her heart, tied it to a rope, and hung it on the wall. This cult has everything. Magic, rituals, child sacrifice, cloaks, daggers, and even a little arms dealing. The fucking sharks ate Mark. Under the dinghy. Strangled him to death so violently that he ended up asphyxiating on his own vomit. We're your hosts. I'm Ashley Richards. And I'm Cameron Dexter. Join us every fucked up Friday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere you listen to podcasts. That's fucked up. Now, let's head to the episode. The wind howled and tore down the streets of the city as Helen left her workplace at the Royal Insurance Building in Liverpool, a towering concrete building that helped to funnel the intensity of the storm. Clinging tightly to her winter hat, Helen hurried to Liverpool Lime Street Station and boarded the train to St Helens. She took a seat in the front carriage and began to tidy her dark brown curls as the quarter past four train pulled away from the platform. The sociable 22-year-old spent the 30-minute journey chatting to a 17-year-old student next to her. The pair discussed the awful weather before proceeding to have a light-hearted chat about work and college. When the train pulled into the station in St Helens, she politely bid goodbye to her travel companion, gave a gentle wave to her work colleague, who had been sitting a few seats away, and then alighted the train. Helen pulled her top coat tightly about her and put on her emerald green gloves as she stepped out into the biting wind. It was growing dark on that cold February afternoon and shielding her face from the cold, Helen hurried to the chemist to pick up a couple of items. She then made her way to the bus stop which stood opposite the glass-fronted Theatre Royal on Corporation Street where the shelter provided some protection from the gale force winds that rattled the glass panes. Fortunately for the young bubbly girl, she didn't have to wait long, as her bus pulled up just moments after she had arrived at the stop. The number 362 bus to Chorley was crowded with people making their way home from work, shopping and school, but Helen was able to find a seat just behind a friend of hers, whom she excitedly told about her plans for the evening. Helen had just started a new relationship, and she was going on a date that night. As she continued to talk to him, the town of St Helens was left behind, as the bus made its way north along the A571, passing through the villages and countryside, towards the village of Billinge, where Helen lived with her mum, Mary, and younger brother, Michael. Getting off the bus at quarter past five, Helen waved to her friend and began to make the minute walk to her home on Standish Avenue, 
a quiet estate of red brick detached houses. Michael McCourt returned home from work at seven o'clock and found his mum in a fearful state. She told her 19-year-old son that Helen hadn't arrived home from work. She hadn't been concerned until Michael had stepped through the door at the time he would normally arrive home. Helen had called her mum just before she left work at 4pm to let her know she was on her way home, and the 22-year-old had asked that her mum have her tea ready for half past five, so she would have plenty of time to get ready for her date. But Helen's tea was now sat in the microwave cold. Given the severe gales that were battering the north of England, and the news reports on the radio stating that train services had been delayed, Mary just presumed that Helen's train had been one of those affected, but Michael had arrived home without any issues. Trying to ease his mum's concerns, Michael suggested that maybe Helen had changed her plans and had gone on her date early, or maybe she'd stayed in Liverpool with a colleague whose train was delayed. However, it wasn't like Helen to not tell her mum if her plans had changed. Mary knew in her heart that something was wrong. But before allowing herself to be overwhelmed with worry, Mary decided to contact Helen's employer, who confirmed that she had left work at 4pm. The concerned mother then called British Rail, who confirmed that Helen's train had departed on time with no issues. After learning that none of her friends had heard from her, not even her new boyfriend Frank, Mary resorted to calling the hospitals, thinking perhaps her 22-year-old daughter had been injured in the storm and hadn't been able to call home. To her dismay, this was not the case, and so Mary, joined by her partner John and Helen's boyfriend Frank, headed out in the car to retrace her daughter's steps. They drove down Village Main Street, where Helen would have gotten off the bus, continued towards St Helens, and on until they reached the Royal Insurance Building in Liverpool. The concrete tower loomed over them in the darkness. The offices were now empty and no lights could be seen in the windows. They had not seen any sign of Helen and the city streets were almost deserted. Running out of ideas, the trio headed to the train station, where they spoke to a member of staff, who when shown a picture of Helen recalled seeing the petite brunette boarding the train at quarter past four. So Helen had left Liverpool but the family were unable to trace her steps from there. And with no other options, they went to the nearest police station to report her missing. At first, police were not overly concerned. After all, Helen was an adult and had only been missing for three hours. The desk sergeant suggested that Helen had just gone for drinks with her work colleague. However, Mary's insistence that something was wrong seemed to sway them to search for Helen. A radio call was made to all officers in the area to be on the lookout for a five-foot-tall brunette with blue-green eyes, wearing a top coat, navy trousers, green gloves and a pair of pearl and opal earrings. Yet as the night passed and the first light of morning arrived and the devastation of the storm was clear to see, with fallen trees and damaged properties, in the McCourt house their own nightmare was enfolding. Staying up all night, they listened for the front door to open, or the phone to ring, just wanting to hear Helen's bubbly voice. But their hopes were answered with silence. With no sightings of Helen overnight, investigators started by looking at her movements on the day she was last seen, beginning with her day at work. During interviews with her colleagues, officers learned that Helen was excited about her date that night, but she was nervous about where she and Frank were going to go. During her lunch break, Helen sat with her friend Susan Fisher, who recalled Helen showing her a scratch on the back of her hand, which had been inflicted by a ring or fingernail during an altercation. It transpired that two days before she disappeared, on the 7th of February 1988, Helen had gone to her local pub, the Georgian Dragon, where she'd met up with some friends and shared some photos. One of her friends warned her that she should be careful because the pictures included an image of a man with a woman that wasn't his girlfriend. Unfortunately, the girlfriend was in the pub at the time, and upon learning that Helen had these photos, she confronted the 22-year-old in the pub's toilets. Janice Smullen, whose boyfriend was in the photos, pinned Helen against the wall and began to shout and swear at her. The altercation was overheard by the landlord, who broke up the argument and proceeded to ban Helen from coming back to the pub. 
Susan stated that she was surprised by this incident, as Helen wasn't the kind of girl to get into fights, and she advised police that the Georgian Dragon was where Helen spent most of her free time, and that she was so upset that she may not be able to go there for her date. Making inquiries at the train station, officers were able to talk to 17-year-old Paul Mackey, who was the student Helen had spoken to the previous day. He remembered talking to a young lady who worked for Royal Insurance, and said he spoke to her until she reached her destination of St Helens. They also spoke to a colleague of Helen's that had had a brief conversation with her before the 22-year-old had left the train. Due to the police acting so quickly, they were able to speak to many witnesses while their memories were still fresh, questioning commuters within 24 hours of Helen's disappearance. Witnesses are not always reliable, with one passenger claiming while at Liverpool Lime Street Station they gave a woman, matching Helen's description, some money for her trip home, as the woman claimed her purse had been stolen. However, given that Helen was able to go shopping and board her bus to Billinge, it does call into question the reliability of this witness's recollection. Police became certain Helen had managed to get the train to St Helens. They were able to trace her route to the bus shelter outside the Theatre Royal and confirmed that she had passed a fish and chip shop and bingo hall to get there. It was quickly established that Helen had boarded her bus to Billinge. Once again, officers were able to talk to people who had seen her. These included her male friend that she spoke to and they also got a statement from another one of Helen's friends, Yvonne Keeley, who told police that, quote, Helen was just her normal talkative self. She is always a real chatterbox, and on Tuesday night she just would never shut up. There didn't seem to be anything wrong. She got off the start before me, alone, I think, end quote. Having established that Helen had made it within 250 yards of her home, police appealed for witnesses to help them establish her movements. Chief Superintendent Eddie Aldred stated, quote, The bus she travelled on was quite crowded. It was the 362 bus, which left the Theatre Royal at St Helens at 5pm. After Helen's journey, the bus continues its journey to Chorley. Because the weather was so atrocious, we are examining the possibility that Helen was offered a lift home by someone she knew. On February the 11th, 1988, two days after Helen's disappearance, Police began conducting searches along the route from the bus stop to Helen's home, including properties where a man lived alone or was alone on the night Helen went missing. One property along the route was the Georgian Dragon Pub, which sat on the corner of Main Street and Garswood Road. During the late 80s, it was classified as a fun pub, and from photographs of the interior, it appeared to have a medieval castle theme. Police were interested in the pub, not only because it was on Helen's route home, but she was a regular patron. This, combined with the altercation she had days before her disappearance, made it a place they hoped they would gain some vital information. The pub landlord, married father of two, Ian Sims, welcomed the officers into the establishment and gave them permission to search the premises, including the flat above the pub. While talking to Ian, he told them that he stayed in the flat on a night and his family lived in the village. This caused police to question him regarding the women's clothing that they had found in his wardrobe. It was at this point he admitted to having an affair. Concerned that the pub was beginning to fill with customers, the officers suggested he came to the station to provide them with a statement, hopeful that he would be able to provide them information about Helen and the altercation over the photographs. At the suggestion of going to the station, Sims began to experience a nervous reaction. He appeared to be having an anxiety attack. He managed to calm down enough to call his mistress, Tracy, to come and look after the pub while he went to the station. While waiting for her arrival, officers continued to talk to Ian. They inquired about why there was dirt in the bathtub, to which he explained they would need to speak to Tracy, as she was the last one who used the bath. Just as Tracy arrived, the officers had begun talking to Ian regarding what he knew about Helen. He advised them that he only knew her as a customer at the pub and didn't know much about her other than that. Upon arrival at the police station, Ian was escorted to an interview room where he was reminded he was not under arrest and they just required a witness statement from him. During Ian's questioning, he contradicted his earlier statement that he only knew Helen as a customer. 
he confessed to police that he had almost slept with Helen on one occasion a few months earlier. When asked about his whereabouts on the 9th of February, Ian stated he had been asleep, or possibly working in the office at the pub till 20 past 7. He then went to the local garage, before going to see his family. He claimed he was only there for 10 minutes, as he and his wife had argued because she had learned about his affair. Sims returned to the pub at 8 o'clock, where he was joined by Tracy, half an hour later. He proceeded to explain that the pair stayed in the flats until he went to carry out closing procedures in the pub at 11pm. His mistress stayed with him until half past two in the morning, at which point he went to sleep. The police then questioned Sims about the scratch marks on his neck, which he explained were from the argument with his wife regarding the affair. However, investigators began to suspect that Ian Sims was hiding something when his wife denied that she scratched her husband during an argument, which caused Ian to change his story. He then suggested the scratches must have come from the altercation between Janice and Helen, speculating that perhaps one of the girls had scratched him when he attempted to break up the fight. A doctor who looked at the scratches confirmed they had been caused by a fingernail, however they were no more than a couple of days old meaning they were unlikely to have been caused during the fight in the toilets. It was a statement from Tracy that also led police to question Ian's truthfulness. Contrary to his claim that he had been with her most of the night, Tracy recalled that Ian had called her at half past six to tell her to come around later that evening, as he was busy, and wouldn't be home till about 8.30pm. However, he did not arrive at the pub till 10 o'clock, leading police to question why had Ian lied and what had he been doing between 6.30pm and 10pm. When these contradictions were put to Sims, he stated that he had not told the truth because he was ashamed. He claimed that following the argument with his wife, he had driven to Southport, a seaside town that was almost an hour away from Billinge, where he sat in his car on the seafront and cried about the state of his marriage. Just three days after Helen McCourt disappeared, the police arrested Ian Sims. Not only had he continued to change his story, but a search of his vehicle and the pub had uncovered some key evidence. When Ian's dark blue Volkswagen Passat was searched, forensic officers discovered an opal and pearl earring, similar to the one Helen was reported wearing. And on the rubber seal of the boot, they found traces of blood. The exterior of the car was caked in mud. Ian explained that he had two dogs and would take them for walks where he would drive on muddy dirt tracks and that was why there was mud on the car. He also stated that the blood on the boot lid may have come from one of his dogs when they had been travelling in the car with him. He was unable to explain the presence of the earring. The earring became more significant when another identical one was found in the back bedroom of the flat and was confirmed by Helen's mum and her work colleagues to be the same as the pair Helen had been wearing the day she disappeared. Further incriminating evidence was discovered inside the pub and the upstairs flat. As you entered the side entrance that led to the flat, forensic officers discovered blood at the bottom of the stairs. It was also discovered on the walls and banister, suggesting an assault had taken place. A bloody fingerprint was discovered on the door at the foot of the stairs. The bloody print on the door to the flat, Ian recalled, occurred after a fight at the pub on New Year's Eve, where he'd cut his hand on glass while breaking up a commotion. He was taken to the flat upstairs to clean up his wound, and he must have touched the door as he passed. Blood was also found in the rear bedroom, where the earring had been recovered. They also found hair. It had been pulled out at the root, suggesting it had been removed during a violent struggle. Sim's bracelet and wedding ring were also discovered to have a mixture of blood and dirt on them. Ian tried to explain these away by claiming that the blood could have been from his dogs and the dirt was probably from when he'd taken them for walks. He was, however, unable to explain the hair, which was confirmed to be consistent with Helen's hair type and colour. While police waited to verify the origins of the blood, they turned their attention to collecting further evidence and statements. The first witness statement came from a man who had gotten off his bus five minutes after Helen had gotten off hers. This witness told police that as he walked towards the Georgian Dragon, they heard a loud, high-pitched scream, which was ended abruptly, but there appeared to be no sign of trouble. 
Shortly after the scream had occurred, the manager of a restaurant close to the pub heard the sound of cleaning coming from the Georgian Dragon, which they thought was unusual as the pub was normally cleaned in the morning. The pub's cleaner confirmed to officers that the pub was always cleaned in the morning, and Ian didn't do any cleaning. So when she arrived for a shift on the 10th of February to find Ian cleaning the carpet at the bottom of the stairs with bleach, she was surprised, not only to see him cleaning, but to see him awake, as he was normally asleep when she arrived at work. He apparently told her his dog had made a mess on the floor and he was cleaning it up. That poor dog is getting blamed for everything. In the days following Helen's disappearance, a reconstruction of her last known movements was carried out. Vast areas of land were searched, including woodland, farms, the Manchester Ship Canal and the River Irwell. There were also old mines and cave systems to investigate. All the 2,000 people arrived to help in the search for Helen, and in total thousands of acres were covered by police and volunteers, yet no sign of the missing 22-year-old was found, and the prime suspect was refusing to admit any responsibility for her disappearance. One major discovery had been made within 14 hours of Helen's disappearance. However, due to the finding being reported to a different police force, it was not automatically connected to her case. At 7.30am on the 10th of February 1988, Gordon Bannister was at the old steelworks tip at Hollings Green, which is about 17 miles from Billinge, when he witnessed a car on the canal bank. Shortly after the car had left, he spotted a pair of underpants, a blue Labatt sweatshirt, blood-stained towel, and a sock, which given its position still inside the trouser legs, and the fact it was dry, could not have been there all night as the strong gales would have blown it away. Not far from these items Gordon found a pair of boots in the middle of the footpath, and a pair of jeans on a bank, which he stated, quote, the jeans were constantinaed on the ground as if he had just stepped out of them. They were muddy, and the day was wet. I put my hand over the top of them, and it seemed to be warm to me. None of the clothing was wet. I have a sensitive touch. Most bakers have. I could feel the warmth of the jeans. I thought to myself, they had been dumped there a few minutes before I arrived. Considering the towel was covered in blood, I looked around for a body. I then went home, end quote. The vehicle Gordon had seen matched the description of Ian's car. And more significantly, the Labatt sweatshirt was linked to the Georgian Dragon pub, which had promotional material for the Labatt brewery. Initially, Ian denied that they belonged to him, but once again, Tracy contradicted his denial, when she confirmed they were his claws. Ian would go on to claim that these items must have been stolen off the radiator at the top of the stairs in his flat. Police continued to attempt to locate Helen. While this search went on, they did receive news from the forensic lab, which confirmed that the numerous blood samples that had been recovered were human in origin. However, because they had no sample of Helen's blood, they were unable to confirm it was hers. Despite the mounting evidence against him, Sims continued to maintain his innocence, and with no signs of a body, officers were concerned that they may not be able to secure a conviction. Even though they had strong forensic evidence, which became more compelling in March, when just three miles from where his claws were found, Helen's handbag was recovered in undergrowth, close to the banks of the River Irwell. Alongside her bag was a black bin liner, which was found to be from a roll that was in the pub. This was discovered by a visit to the factory, where investigators learned that each roll that was produced had a unique perforation. They also recovered a top coat, a pair of emerald green gloves, and a pair of navy trousers. When these items were shown to Mary, she confirmed they were her daughters, before becoming so distressed that she had to be sedated. The pair of trousers had fibres that matched the carpets from the staircase to the flat, the hallway, and the rear bedroom. Ian told police that Helen used to attend lock-ins at the pub which is where drinks were served after it was closed for business on a night, and she probably got fibres on her claws on one of these occasions. However, Mary told police that the 9th of February was the first time Helen had worn them trousers, as her daughter had only just bought them. The mixture of carpet fibres suggested that the wearer had been dragged up the staircase, along the hallway and into the rear bedroom. A piece of electrical cord was also found with Helen's belongings 
Within the cord, there were a mixture of human and dog hair, and teeth impressions consistent with a canine. Ian told police that he used the cord to play with his dogs. However, the presence of hair, similar to Helen's, made police speculate that Helen may have been strangled with the cord. Police moved their search to focus on the area where Helen's possessions had been found. This included bringing in a diving team to search the River Irwell, and a bulldozer to dig up recently disturbed ground. But again, no further signs of Helen were discovered. Even though they did not have a body, they believed the forensic evidence against Ian Sims was overwhelming, improving that he had murdered Helen and concealed her body. However, in the absence of her remains, police knew they needed to build the strongest case possible against their suspect. So they tried a new forensic technique. They sent samples of the blood found in the various locations to be compared with samples from Helen's parents and her brother. When these came back confirming that there was an almost indisputable probability that it was a familial match, and likely to belong to Helen, they knew they now had evidence that could convict her killer. Sims had spent over a year in custody by the time the trial began on the 21st of February 1989 at Liverpool Crown Court. The defendant continued to maintain his innocence and despite their best efforts, Helen's remains hadn't been found, which made the trial one of the first cases to go to court despite the absence of a body since the Second World War. However, unlike the case nearly 50 years earlier, the prosecution had strong forensic evidence against Ian Sims. The day after the trial began, the judge and jury were taken to the key locations involved, with the prosecution hoping that it would help them to visualise the crime scenes better than photos, all in the aim of presenting a compelling case. The prosecutor, Brian Levinson, delivered his opening statement, quote, The crime alleges that she was murdered, and her body hidden so well that it has not been found, although very considerable effort had been put into looking. The Crown further alleges that the person responsible for murdering her, and then trying to cover up the murder, is this man, Ian Sims. Regarding the dates of the 7th to the 10th of February, Mr Levinson implied that Sims had lied to the police about where he had been and the times he had claimed he had been there. He tried to use his wife and mistress as alibis. Both women gave statements contradicting his. His wife denied she had scratched her husband, and Tracy told police a completely different timeline to the one Sims had provided, stating she didn't see him till 10 o'clock on the 9th of February. However, Sims claimed he had seen her an hour and a half earlier. So what was he doing in that time? Had he really been to Southport, as he claimed, or was he disposing of Helen's body? With regards to the claims he was at Southport, Prosecutor Levinson stated, quote, It was a daft lie. You were just panicking because you did not know what the police knew. In an attempt to portray Ian Sims as a compulsive liar, Prosecutor Brian Levison asked the defendant, quote, Would you agree you have perfected the art of lying so that you can do it not only with ease and skill, but also more successfully? Ian denied that this was the case. The details of his affair were revealed to the court. 22-year-old Tracy Hornby told the jury about her affair with Sims, which started when she was 18 stating she met Sims in 1987 at the Georgian Dragon pub, where he was working as a bouncer. She stated that the relationship became intimate at the end of 1986. She went on to state that she did not know Ian's wife personally, but had seen her around the village. She continued by saying that in 1987, when Ian began sleeping at the Georgian Dragon, following security concerns, she used to stay with him. At first it was just on a Friday and Saturday, but soon it became a more regular occurrence. She also advised that they would go on holiday together to the Lake District and to Tenerife. Tracy told the court, quote, I loved him, and I still do. 32-year-old Ian confessed to his adulterous relationship with Tracy. He stated that on one occasion, when his wife, two children and his mother went on holiday to Spain, he stayed behind on the pretense of needing to run the pub. But instead, he and Tracy went to Tenerife. More of his lies were exposed to the court. Not only was it revealed that he had lied to police regarding his relationship, he also deceived Helen's uncles, who visited the Georgian Dragon shortly after she had been reported missing, in the hopes that the staff may shed light on where she could be. During the course of the conversation, 
Sims denied that Helen was a regular at the pub and dismissed claims that she had ever attended a lock-in. Sims told the court that he initially lied about a relationship with Helen as Tracy was present and he didn't want her to know about the altercation between the two women because Tracy disliked Janice. The true extent of his relationship came to light during the trial. Despite his denials about knowing Helen, he did admit shortly after Helen had split with her boyfriend of two years, he and Helen had spent a night in September the previous year drinking after hours. Ian claimed that the pair ended up in bed together, while Tracy was asleep in the other bedroom. But after they had started kissing, Helen decided she didn't want to have sex with him, and he respected her decision. If his story is true... I do question whether he would have been so understanding if Tracy hadn't been asleep in the room next door. After all, it has been alleged that Ian had made sexual advances on Helen previously, which she had spurned. Part of his story is corroborated by an entry in Helen's diary on September the 18th, 1987, in which she wrote that she had spent the night at the pub and didn't arrive home until 4am the following morning. However, she does not verify Sims' account that she became intimate with him, so we only have Ian's words that this incident happened how he described. Many of the witnesses called to testify alleged that they were aware that Ian disliked Helen. Some speculated that she was spreading rumours about his affair. Others claimed it was because she was talking about the after-hours drinking sessions at the pub, which would have concerned Sims when you consider that until the introduction of extended hours for pubs, many would close at 11pm, and lock-ins were against the law, and could have resulted in the landlord losing their drinks licence. Following him barring Helen from the pub on the 7th, he was allegedly heard talking about how much he hated Helen. Tracy's sister, Jane, testified regarding Ian's feelings about Helen, quote, Ian Sims did not really like Helen McCourt because of the way she was with him, This was corroborated by Helen's friend, Miss Bothwell, who recalled the disagreement with Janice Smullen and comments that Ian made afterwards. She began by describing her friend, quote, Helen was very happy and outgoing. She was a very nice friend and very pretty. She then advised the jury that after Sims had told Helen to leave the pub, following the fight in the toilets, she overheard a conversation between Ian and Janice, in which he told the latter that he didn't like Helen. However, Sims told the court that he only said this to calm Janice down and claimed he had a good relationship with her. Other witnesses testified regarding Ian's movements on the 9th of February. At quarter to six, Amanda Nugent was making a phone call in her boyfriend's living room in a house directly opposite the Georgian Dragon when her attention was drawn to a dark blue car reversing onto the pub car park. Shortly after this, Christine Twist recalled how she had been driving down Main Street, the road where Helen would have gotten off her bus, and as she got near the Georgian Dragon, she was forced to brake heavily by a dark blue car exiting the car park, before driving off at speed towards St Helens, and she placed the time of the incident at approximately 5 to 6, about 50 minutes after Helen had got off the bus. When Sean thought us of Ian's car, Christine confirmed that it could have been the same vehicle. The vehicle's direction of travel is interesting, as it would be possible that Ian was driving to dump the clothing in the Hollins Green and Earlham areas where they were found. This would have meant he would have had to make an almost two-hour round trip, which would have enabled him to be back in Billinge by 8pm. However, he was not seen by Tracy till 10pm, so what was he doing for the remaining two hours? The witness that placed Ian's car at Hollins Green at 7.30am on the morning following Helen's disappearance calls into question whether Sims had made the trip the night before, so where was he going in such a hurry? Ian initially claimed he had never been to the Hollins Green or Earlham area, yet he later changed his statement, claiming that he had been there when he went to bodybuilding competitions and had been to the area on the day of Helen's disappearance as he had gone to book a hall for a show featuring exotic dancers. Ian Sims testified that he was being framed for the murder, and that the police had lied to make the facts fit their theory. He claimed they had already decided that he was responsible, and made the evidence appear to support their idea. He further argued that someone else was responsible for the murder, and that that individual had planted evidence. 
He stated that it is likely that others had a key to his flat and at least six people had access to his car and any one of them could have taken his clothing from the radiator in the flat and driven his car between 10pm and the time the cleaner arrived in the morning. Once again, you have to question if he ever named the individuals who had access to the vehicle and if the police followed up on this lead. In closing, Brian Levinson QC told the court, quote, This is not a case of someone else wearing Ian Sims clothing and jewellery. One of the rings would not even come off. This, undeniably and incontrovertibly, involves Ian Sims himself. The colour of the mud found on his bracelet and two rings, one of which had to be removed by a doctor, was similar to that found in his car and on his clothing. Sims has at least been up to the wrist in pale mud. The prosecution submits that the scientists alone make the case that Sims absolutely intended to kill her, or at the very least, to cause her really serious bodily harm, and that her attacker was Ian Sims. And there was evidence which would prove she was dead. It was equally overwhelming that she was indeed attacked, and there was not the slightest hint of any lawful excuse for such an attack. There were a number of features indicating the clearest intent of the attacker to at least inflict really serious harm, end quote. Although it could not be proven, the theory was presented that Helen may have called at the Georgian Dragon pub on her way home. She wanted to apologise for the altercation on the 7th of February, possibly in the hopes that she would be able to have her date there later that night. But at some point shortly after Helen entered the side door, she was struck in the head at least twice by Sims, causing blood to end up on the walls, stairs and carpet. She was then dragged upstairs, the carpet fibres remaining on her navy trousers before being strangled in the rear bedroom with the electrical cord. It is suggested that she put up a fight, during which she not only lost her earring, but was able to inflict scratches on Ian's neck. It was believed by police that Sims then left the body in the back bedroom, until Tracy had left at half past two the following morning, and then proceeded to dispose of the body, returning to the property in time to be seen by the cleaner. Having heard the testimony of over 200 witnesses, the judge, Mr Justice Caulfield, summed up the case, quote, If Ian Sims is guilty of murder, he had no respect for the corpse. Those who loved Helen were denied the tribute they could have paid to her. What remains of Helen McCourt? Just a few strands of hair. But you may think, eventually, important strands of hair. If Sims killed Helen McCourt, he still retained enough passion for himself to make love to his young mistress after committing the murder. It is a heavy responsibility, but I urge you to strive to reach a unanimous verdict. And that verdict was reached after five and a half hours of deliberation, when the foreman announced that the jury had found Ian Sims guilty of the murder of Helen McCourt, and he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 16 years, which meant he would have been eligible for parole in 2001. However, despite many appeals and parole hearings, Ian Sims remained in prison until earlier this year, much to the dismay of Helen's mother, Mary. Understandably, she was upset that her daughter's killer was released, but more devastating for her was the fact that he had refused to disclose where Helen's body is. Even after receiving a letter from a heartbroken Mary pleading for him to allow her to give Helen a Christian burial, he did respond to the correspondence, a letter that the grieving mother refuses to make public due to its hurtful content. Every chance they have, Helen's family form their own search party and head out to various potential burial sites. They undertake the gruelling task of digging, searching in drains and ditches, putting themselves at risk of harm in the hope they will find Helen's remains. As well as searching, the family also collects soil samples to compare against those found on Sim's clothing and his car. But so far, no match has ever been found. Helen's family have had their hopes dashed on many occasions. Seven years after she went missing, remains were discovered in the area of Prescott, a town which is in close proximity to Norsley Safari Park. These remains were later revealed to be animal bones. Then in August 1997, a body was recovered from Coniston Water in the Lake District. The body was wearing a blue 1960s-style baby doll nightgown, had their arms and legs tied together, and was concealed in two black bin bags, 
and a black canvas bag. However, after checking dental records, it was revealed not to be Helen and were later confirmed to be the remains of Carol Park, a lady who had vanished in 1976, whose story I will tell in a future episode. It would be a further 16 years before there would be a potential break in the case. When, on the 16th of October 2013, police exhumed a grave behind St Aidan's Church in Billinge, Detective Chief Superintendent Tim Keelan said, quote, We are acting on information suggesting that Helen's body could have been placed in this particular grave, and with the agreement of the family who own this grave, and following approval from the relevant authorities, we are now seeking to determine if this is the case. I would like to say a particular thanks to the family of those in the grave, who put their reservations to one side to support Merseyside Police in relation to the intelligence we received. They have displayed a very altruistic attitude, based on their desire to provide a conclusion to the family of Helen McCourt, who have suffered from not knowing where she is for almost 25 years. End quote. Once again, this search concluded in heartbreak for Helen's loved ones. Mary McCourt told the Mirror newspaper, I'm determined that while I'm living, I will carry on searching. I want to lay her to rest, so I know she's at peace and not lying in some horrible place alone. As well as having to deal with being unable to lay her daughter to rest, Mary also had to contend with the knowledge that Ian Sims would be eligible for release by 2001. And every year since 2001, she has attended the parole hearings, in the hope that Helen's killer would remain behind bars until he had revealed what he had done with her body. Yet he continued to deny any involvement in her daughter's disappearance. It was because of this fear that he would be released before revealing the location of Helen's body that Mary launched a campaign in December 2015, calling for a change in the law that would prevent convicted murderers who refuse to reveal the location of bodies of victims from being released on parole. Despite many setbacks, Mary received support from other grieving families, including Winnie Bennett, the mother of Moore's murderer's victim, Keith, whose body has never been recovered. In May this year, the Prisoner's Disclosure of Information about Victims Bill, or Helen's Law, was passed by Parliament, but it was too late to prevent the release of Ian Sims who was granted freedom in February this year. The parole board explained their decision, quote, Taking into account the denial, the refusals to reveal where the victim's body is, all the risk factors, the progress that Mr Sims has made, the considerable change to his behaviour, the fact that he has not been involved in any violence or substance misuse for many years, his protective factors, the recommendations from all the professionals and all the evidence presented at the hearing, the panel was satisfied that Mr Sims met the test for release. In response to this news, Mary told BBC Breakfast, quote, I didn't think a heart could break twice, but mine did. All I want, all I've ever wanted, is to have my child back. Whatever tiny bits of pieces there are, it's my daughter and I want them back. And I can't have them now. So where are Helen McCourt's remains? There has been so much speculation over the years as to where her body could be. One suggestion has been that Sims disposed of her body in the River Irwell or the Manchester Ship Canal, which eventually feeds into the River Mersey and on into the Irish Sea. If this is the case, it is possible that given the fact the river may have been swollen following the storm and fast moving at the time of Helen's disappearance, it is likely her body could have been swept downstream particularly if her body had been placed in the water near the location where her clothing was found, as this area wasn't searched until three weeks after her disappearance. The Rixton Clay Pits have been another area of interest. Sitting near the town of Hollings Green, the site was used to extract clay for use in the manufacturing of bricks. Since its closure in the 1960s, the area has been left to return to its wild state and is now classified as a nature reserve. This has meant that there are many pits, lakes and rough terrain where Sims could have concealed the body. However, despite several searches of the area over the years, so far nothing has been found. 
Billings and the surrounding areas were known as mining communities and as such, there are numerous abandoned tunnels and mine shafts, as well as natural cave systems, all of which would be places a body could be hidden. It is also speculated that there is access to an old tunnel beneath the Georgian Dragon pub. However, if this was the case, surely the police would have searched them. The final suggestion I have read is the speculation that Ian Sims disposed of the body in the incinerator at the now demolished Billinge Maternity Hospital. It is alleged that he had a friend who worked at the hospital and had access to the incinerator, and this friend would allow Sims to dispose of the pub's waste there on occasion, which does seem like a viable option if true. My only question would be, if Sims had burned the body, why didn't he destroy the clothing and other items in the incinerator too? Sadly, it's been over 30 years since Helen's disappearance, and the chances of her remains being found grow slimmer every year. And now that the only person who possibly knows the answers is free, and has no incentive to talk, unless he has a change of conscience and chooses to end the heartache for Helen's loved ones. However, I doubt that will happen, considering Sims has always maintained his innocence. By disclosing the location, he would be confirming his guilt. Thank you for joining me for episode 34 of It's Murder Up North. As always, you can support the show by listening and telling your friends, leaving a kind review on iTunes, joining the Facebook discussion group or Twitter, or you can sign up to Patreon for early access to ad-free episodes and other exclusive content. Episode 35 will be available on Sunday. So in the meantime, keep an eye on those shadows. 